is what Kia is going to speak about today. That is the leadership that he offers. I am proud to serve as his shadow chancellor. Now, I would like to say that I'm introducing our next prime minister, but you never know how many Tories are gonna to get through before the next election. So let me just say that I will introduce Britain's next Labour prime minister, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you for all your hard work for our party and for our country. And Happy New Year to everyone here. Thank you so much for coming along this morning. And welcome to UCL here East. Now, this is a bit of London that some of you are getting pretty familiar with in the last few days, so I've decided that uh, I won't tell the Prime Minister where I'm going on holiday this year, just in case I find him there as well. But look, 2023 marks a new chapter for Britain. With a new king to be crowned in May, we must look forward with hope. But for hope to flourish, Britain needs change. And I don't think anyone seriously disputes that. It's the story of the country right now. Amidst all the chaos is a growing impatience for change, for real change, lasting change, national renewal. And yes, as they've done throughout our history, the British people are turning to Labour to provide that change. In 2022, they looked at us again, and I felt, for the first time in a while, we could return their gaze with confidence that the changes we've made on anti-Semitism, on national security and NATO, on making economic stability the platform for everything we do, has restored a degree of trust, laid a foundation. And this year, we've got to build on that. People know we care. They always know the Labour Party cares. And they can now see a party that is both competent and compassionate a party that understands what it means to put service to the country first. <laughs> Colleagues, our task for 2023 is not to rest on our laurels. We need to push forward and rise to the moment, prove we can be a bold reforming government, show not just what the Tories have done to Britain, but the Britain that Labour can build a fairer, greener, more dynamic country with an economy that works for everyone, not just those at the top, and a politics which trusts communities with the power to control their destiny. A new government and a new way of governing. Britain needs both, and with Labour, Britain will get both. That, that's my message of hope for the new year. We're going to roll up our sleeves, fix the problems, and improve our country. We can't keep expecting the British people to just suck it up, not without the hope, the possibility of something better. And get me wrong, I'm under no illusions about the scale of the challenges we face. Houses that get burgled countless times, yet the police never come. Hospitals, if you can believe it, putting out messages, begging patients to stay away from A&E. Children going to school hungry. And it's not just the poorest who are struggling. Millions of families, pensioners, working people, people who've always kept their heads above water are going without decent food and heating. Cutting back on their holidays, their meals out, Christmas presents, all the little things that make life more enjoyable. Now, sometimes people say to me, we'll get through this. Britain's been through worse. And they're right. I grew up working class in the 1970s. I know what a cost of living crisis feels like. The anxiety and, yes, the shame. 
of not being able to pay bills that only months ago were affordable. Our phone was cut off like this. And by the way, that was it. There were no mobiles back then. We got through it. Britain will get through it. The problem is that's exactly what the Tories are banking on. They're going to turn around in 2024 and try to claim some kind of political credit for the sacrifices working people are making right now. As if it's not their mistakes people are paying for, again. But at the heart of this cynical politics, achieve together because for all the challenges we face I remain optimistic about our future I believe in our country I believe in our businesses I believe in our people and I believe in our spirit it was there in the coming together for the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II in the thousands of people who welcomed refugees into their homes from Ukraine and elsewhere in the resilience of our retailers, our pubs and venues, the creative industries fighting back from the pandemic. The brilliance of key workers, nurses, doctors, teachers, volunteers and carers who got us to that point. It's in our love of sport and our excellent at it. The double world champion cricketers, the Commonwealth Games that were a beacon of diversity, the lionesses who brought football home. It's <laughs> It's our universities, our young people, the researchers in this building and those like it, our manufacturing genius, our superpower services, our startups and innovators, the green entrepreneurs, the builders and retrofitters, insulators and engineers who will bring us energy independence and cheaper bills, the scientists making healthcare more responsive, saving more lives. And it's in our communities, in towns and cities, like Burnley, Wolverhampton, Grimsby and Swindon, where the people will tell you, in no uncertain terms, that they do have ambition for themselves and their community. What they lack is a government that shares their ambition. Because all these achievements I've listed, all that possibility, is a testament to our untapped potential. So this year, Let's imagine instead what we could achieve if we match the ambition of the British people. Unlock their pride and their purpose. Give them an economy and a politics that they deserve. <laughs> this is crucial because economic change must go hand in hand with political change. We have an economy that hoards potential and a politics that hoards power. And it's no coincidence, no accident, that this leaves us with more regional inequality than anywhere else in Europe. They feed off each other. And that's why I say Britain needs a completely new way of governing. Yes, we need to use the power of dynamic government, harness technology to drive through reform, convene a real industrial partnership between business and unions. But all of that must be done in service of a politics which trusts communities. I'm utterly convinced about this. The Westminster system is part of the problem. Now, I came into politics late in my career. I've run large organizations, institutions that had to serve our country. And I've changed them all, including the Labour Party. That's why I came into politics eight years ago. 
a new way to serve, a new way to get things done, more opportunities to change our country for the better. But I have to say, I haven't found much of that in Westminster. Yes, there are good people, of course there are. Many MPs share my determination to tackle Britain's problems quickly. But as a system, it doesn't work. You know, sometimes I hear talk about a huge day in Westminster. But all that's happened is someone has passionately described a problem. And then that's it. Nothing's changed. The circus moves on. Rinse and repeat. Honestly, you can't overstate how much a short-term mindset dominates Westminster. And from there, how it infects all the institutions which try and fail to run Britain from the center. I call it sticking plaster politics. Sticking plaster politics. And in a kind of last minute frenzy, it sometimes delivers relief. But the long-term cure, that always eludes us. And it's at the heart of all the problems we see across the country right now. I'll give you an example energy and the cost of living crisis. Now, thank heavens we have a price freeze this winter that Labour's campaigning in the summer eventually brought the government to our position and its senses. But truth be told, the price freeze is the perfect example of sticking plaster politics. Necessary, of course, but nonetheless an expensive last minute fix papering over cracks in our energy security that have been on display for years. Now, don't get me wrong, nobody criticizes the government for the effects of the war in Ukraine. But the war didn't scrap home insulation, the war didn't ban onshore wind, and the war didn't stall British nuclear energy. The Tory government did that. And the story is the same with the NHS and care and with all our public services. The workforce and morale crisis has been an iceberg on the horizon for years. Low pay, housing, childcare, immigration, planning, skills, investment in technology, time and again it's the same pattern. You saw it yesterday from the Prime Minister. Commentary without solution. More promises, more platitudes. No ambition to take us forward. No sense of what the country needs. 13 years of nothing but sticking plaster politics. It's why every crisis hits Britain harder than our competitors. The only country in the G7 still poorer than it was before the pandemic. The worst decade for growth in two centuries. Seven million on waiting lists and rising. That hasn't happened elsewhere. You know, one of the greatest privileges of being born in Britain, certainly for all of my life, is knowing that if you get ill, if you have a serious accident, you'll get decent health care, whatever your circumstances. Not every country has that, and the anxiety it causes is huge. It's why 11 years ago, in the Olympic Stadium a few hundred yards away, we put the NHS on display to the world. It's who we are. We can't let sticking plaster politics destroy it. I won't stand for that, and Labour won't stand for that. <laughs> That's why we've got a fully costed plan for the biggest NHS training programme in our history. We'll tackle the capacity crisis with more doctors, more nurses, more health visitors. And we'll broker a fair pay agreement that will transform the paying conditions for every carer in the country, give care workers the respect and the status that they deserve, and help them drive up standards in our care system. That's a massive part of the NHS crisis. I heard the Prime Minister yesterday, and he's still in denial about how we got here still too weak to challenge the vested interests in his party that hold Britain back. Don't expect that to change. On planning, on onshore wind, on the NHS, 
Not now, not for the past 13 years, not ever. Fundamentally, the Tories don't accept that to help working people succeed, you need dynamic government. Government driven by a strategic purpose. They don't see that the challenges we face on climate change, artificial intelligence, caring for an ageing society, means a hands-off approach to our economy and public services just won't wash anymore. And this is a real political divide. But it's not just Tory ideology that drives sticking plaster politics. It's the whole Westminster system. No similar country puts so much decision-making in the powers of so few people. It's no wonder the problems of communities up and down the country don't get the attention they deserve. Just think about it practically for a minute. Imagine Britain is a workplace. Now, the boss and the senior management, yes, of course, they have to take some of the big decisions, the strategic ones. You wouldn't have them taking every decision, would you? Standing over your shoulder telling you exactly how to use a robot arm getting them to write the code for computer-aided manufacturing. Of course not. Nothing would get done. Big decisions would get put off because you wouldn't be able to see the wood for the trees. While other decisions taken by the wrong people, not close enough to the action, would get botched. Yet this is exactly how we try to run Britain. It's why, for all the talk of levelling up, nothing ever happens. It's just that old game of passionately identifying a problem rather than facing the real solution and accepting Westminster must give power away. Well, no more. No more sticking plaster politics. No more Westminster hoarding power. No more holding back this country's economic potential. This year, we're going to show how real change comes from unlocking the pride and purpose of British communities. And, there are two steps to this. First, we will modernise central government so that it becomes dynamic, agile, strong and above all focused, driven by clear measurable objectives, national missions, a new approach to the power of government, more strategic, more relaxed about bringing the expertise of public and private business and union, town and city, and using that partnership to drive our country forward. We will announce these missions in the coming weeks. Our manifesto will then be built around them, and they will be the driving force of the next Labour government. They will push us on to a better future, a decade of national renewal. <laughs> but let me be clear, none of this should be taken as code for Labour getting its big government checkbook out. Of course investment is required. I can see the damage the Tories have done to our public services as plainly as anyone else but we won't be able to spend our way out of their mess. It's not as simple as that. Let me give you an example of our different approach. You start with a mission, a plan for 100% clean power generation by 2030. That mission builds on an opportunity that clean British energy is nine times cheaper than imported fossil fuels. It's backed by investment, public and private in wind, solar, nuclear, hydrogen, green steel, and carbon capture. It's galvanized by reform, by Great British Energy, a newly publicly owned company that will take this opportunity and turn it into good, secure, well-paid British jobs. And it's driven by speed and a long-term vision that doesn't back down when the going gets tough, when vested interests take you on over planning or trying to hold on to fossil fuels. Because if you take action early, if we did this now, then businesses and working people get cheaper bills forever. Our country gets energy independence from tyrants like Putin forever. And we can give every community a shot at the green jobs of the future. 
That's just one example, one mission. But it shows our recipe for taking on sticking plaster politics. It's new technology unleashed by private investment and private enterprise, tackling a huge social challenge and then providing a new foundation for long-term prosperity, which crucially communities can build on themselves. And this is the second of our two steps, giving communities the chance to control their economic destiny. The argument is devastatingly simple. The decisions which create wealth in our communities should be taken by local people with skin in the game. And a huge power shift out of Westminster can transform our economy, our politics, and our democracy. I'll go back to Brexit. Yes, a whole host of issues were on that ballot paper. But as I went around the country campaigning for Remain, I couldn't disagree with the basic case so many Leave voters made to me. People who wanted public services they could rely on. High streets they could be proud of. Opportunities for the next generation. And all of this in their town or their city. It was the same in the Scottish referendum in 2014. Many of those who voted yes did so for similar reasons. And it's not an unreasonable demand. It's not unreasonable for us to recognize the desire of communities to stand on their own feet. It's what take back control meant. The control people want is control over their lives and their communities. So we will embrace the take back control message, but we'll turn it from a slogan into a solution, from a catchphrase into change. We will spread control out of Westminster, devolve new powers over employment support, transport, energy, climate change, housing, culture, childcare provision, and how councils run their finances. And we'll give communities a new right to request powers which go beyond even that. All this will be in a new take back control bill, a centerpiece of our first King's speech. That bill will deliver on the demands for a new Britain, a new approach to politics and democracy, a new approach to growth and our economy. <laughs> 2022 killed the Tory idea that it's only those at the top who grow our economy. 2023 will be the year Labour shows a new plan for growth. The year when we accept that if the South East races ahead, redistribution can't be the one word plan for the rest of Britain. That was also part of the Brexit moment. Working people want their town or city to prosper by standing on their own feet. They want growth from the grassroots to create wealth on their terms and in their way. So let me spell it out. No more shortcuts. Strong, dynamic government is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Communities need strong public services, but that's not enough on its own. For national renewal, there is no substitute for a robust private sector creating wealth in every community. You can see this in the precision engineers and life scientists in Glasgow, the video game visionaries in Dundee, the cyber security firms of the valleys in South Wales, the hydrogen corridor in Teesside, nano manufacturing in Northern Ireland, ceramics in North Staffordshire, fuel cells in the West Midlands, robotics in Manchester. We need to turbocharge this potential, but Westminster can't do that on its own. It can only do it with communities. That's why Labour will give them the trust, the power, and the control. We won't accept decline, won't write our country off, won't leave Britain in a braced position, buffeted from crisis to crisis, holding on, trying to make it through. That's no way to live, and it's no way to run a country. So this year, in place of sticking plaster politics, we'll set out the case for change, the case for a new Britain,
the case for hope that the country will get better, that politics can be a force for good, that Britain can be run in the interests of working people. We can feel the public looking at us again, and we won't let up. We'll work every day to earn their trust, show them a new way of governing, and lead them to the fairer, greener, more dynamic Britain where aspiration is rewarded, working people succeed, communities control their own destiny, and where politics doesn't hide from the big challenges that face our children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're now going to take some questions from the media, and I want to get through quite a few of these, so can I encourage um, all our colleagues from the media just to ask one question rather than the growing habit of two or three or four. So uh, I think we're going to start with Chris Mason uh, from the BBC. Chris. Thank you. Chris Mason, BBC News. You said today that Labour uh, won't be getting its big government checkbook out. Uh, will you match the Conservative spending limits going into the election? Well, um, first, Chris, that commitment in relation to the uh, checkbook is because we know that we're going to inherit, inherit um, a badly damaged economy and a badly damaged country. And therefore, we have to be absolutely clear that we can't just spend our way out of that mess. Um, obviously, we'll set out our case as we go into um, the election. Um, and we will already set out our fiscal rules in terms of spending for day to day, only borrowing to invest uh, and getting debt down as a percentage uh, of our economy. They will be the rules that we go into. But what I'm trying to set out today is a different approach um, and making it absolutely clear that it's a different way of working. It's about partnership. It's about pushing power away from Westminster that matters um, in all of this. But um, after 13 years of failure um, on every level, we know we're going to inherit a very badly damaged economy. Um, and therefore, uh, that is what drives me to say um, we will not be getting out that big government checkbook. Um, everything that we say we will do will be fully costed and set out as it already has been, and we'll do that going into the election. Thank you, Chris. I've got Ali from Sky. Hey, Ali from, Ali. from Sky. Now, you've criticised Richard Sunak yesterday for being light on policy, but when it comes to the big issues that are impacting people right now, NHS pay, the strikes, what exactly are you going to do to help people? It's not clear what you're saying beyond saying that you would do a better job than the Tories. You say you're not willing to get your big checkbook out, but how are you going to fix those problems, help people right now? What difficult decisions are you going to be willing to make? Uh, well, look, Ali, I mean, look, I have criticised um, the Prime Minister. You're absolutely right. I thought his um, promises were weak and low ambition. Um, inflation is the biggest example of that. Saying you get inflation down at a rate lower than is already predicted is not a big promise to the, pu the British public. Um, and the idea that after 13 years of failure can come along in the 13th year and say, I've got five new promises, um, please give us one more chance, I just feel is so far removed from reality. But in relation to your question, um, obviously there are things we need to do this winter to get us through. Um, and we've argued the case for discharging patients more quickly, virtual wards. There are many things we're making use of facilities. Um, but what we can't do, and this is really the centerpiece of what I'm trying to say, is every year we go into an NHS crisis, it just gets worse and worse and worse, and so we're in the worst one ever now. Um, and that's sticking plaster politics. We can do something this year to get through, but if we don't um, actually understand the fundamentals of change, we'll be back in the same crisis next year and the year after. And central to that is the workforce. And that's why we've said that we will have a fully funded plan to bring in you know, thousands and thousands more nurses, more doctors, um, uh, et cetera, more medical staff coming into uh, the NHS. Because in the end, that's the only way we're going to get out of this. That long, you know, putting another sticking plaster on is necessary. Of course it is. It's a bit like 
um, the energy and cost of living crisis. We've got to do it for the one more winter. But if we don't tackle the fundamentals, we'll be back in this cycle next year and the year after and the year after. And that's what's been one of the biggest failures of politics in the last 13 years. Thank you, Ali. Uh, Gary. Gary Gibbon, Channel 4 News. Um, it doesn't sound like you do want to splash the cash. So beyond your sort of costed extra uh, investment in things like the NHS, you are going to be looking for more from the same money or more from less even. Uh, sometimes in public services. Can I ask you about one specific uh, area of that? Tony Blair looked to the private sector to uh, help with that kind of efficiency saving. Do you think there's more scope for the private sector delivering uh, public services? Have we reached the outer limits of it? Is it sometimes what works? Uh, could there be a whole new development in that uh, under your premiership? Well, Gary, uh, thank you for that question. The, the, the way I see it is this, that um, if a party wins an election and sets out its stall, its programme for change, uh, it's then got to answer the question, well, how are you going to deliver that? Um, and there are three basic models. One is you suck it all up to the centre and try to deliver it all um, through the state. I don't think that works, and we won't be doing that, to be clear. Um, the other is to say, well, we've set out what we want to achieve, but um, it's the market that knows best, so we'll now leave it to the market. Um, I don't believe in that model. I don't think that's worked either. And that's why what I'm proposing today, what we've put on the table, is a partnership model where with the, you know, an agile, active state working with, in partnership with private business, we deliver together, each clear about what their role is in that partnership, and that's the way in which we deliver for the future. But Gary, there's another part to your question which is really important as well, because I've obviously said um, we're not gonna get the big checkbook out, but that is reform. Having run a public service for five years, I ran a public service uh, in the criminal justice sector for five years, um, I've long been an advocate of reform, and we have to reform our public services, whether that's health um, or criminal justice, because um, you know the idea that simply putting more money in, which of course is needed and will bring about some improvement, won't transform our public services in the way that I think they need to deliver in the 21st century. Gary, thank you for that. Um, Harry from ITV. Thank you. Um, you've said you want to avoid sticking plaster politics, but sometimes immediate crises require short-term solutions. So take the strikes this week, for example. What would you actually do differently in your, in your negotiations with the unions. You said that you would take them seriously. Well, would you ignore the NHS pay recommendation? Would you offer more than 5%? You said you wouldn't offer 19%, but would you offer more than what's already been offered at the moment? Look, Harry, firstly, I think it's very important in relation to industrial action to understand quite how much people are struggling to make ends meet and why they're driven to this action, particularly the nurses never been on strike nationally ever before. Um, now, I don't want to see these strikes. I don't think there's any nurse, certainly that I've spoken to or heard of, who wants to be on strike. On the contrary, before they went on strike, in those final days, they said to the government, just come in the room with us and talk to us and we won't go on strike. And the government refused. So I would get in the room. I would talk to them and talk to them and there's going to have to be compromise. And I also ask Harry this, you know, the government hasn't got a strategy. What's it going to do? Will it go in the room in a few weeks' time and reach an agreement that they could have reached before the strike started and then watch everything that's happened in the last few weeks happen, all that distress to people, by doing agreements sometime down the line in a few weeks? Is that their strategy? Or will they just slug it out month after month after month in a war with our nurses? I think we're entitled to say they clearly have got no strategy whatsoever for dealing with these strikes, particularly the nurses' strikes. Thank you, Harry. And Lucy uh, from Times. Hi, Lucy Fisher from Times Radio. Um, we know that the government are shortly expected to bring forward anti-strike legislation. You've made clear that you think those laws are wrong. Will you commit to repealing them if Labour come into government? And do you think any new measures are needed to ensure minimum service levels for the public in crucial sectors like health and rail? Uh, Lucy, look, um, firstly, frankly, the government is all over the show on this. Every day there's a different briefing as to whether there's going to be legislation, what's going to be in it, when it's going to come. And I think there's a reason for that. 
and that's because I don't think this legislation is going to work. And I'm pretty sure they've had an assessment that tells them uh, that it's likely to make a bad situation worse. And so in answer to your question, um, obviously, um, you know, we'll look at what they bring forward, but if it's further restrictions, then we will repeal it. Um, and the reason for that is I do not think that legislation is the way that you bring an end to industrial disputes. You have to get in the room and compromise. You can't legislate your way out of 30 years, 13 years um, of failure. So, um, you know, as I say, the government's all over the show. Um, will we um, repeal it? Yes, uh, we will. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, Kieran from The Guardian. Kieran Stacey Kieran. from The Guardian. Hi. Um, <clears throat> you talk about nurses. At the moment, the government appears to be budgeting for a 2% pay rise for nurses in 2023-2024. You said 19% is too much. Will you at least say that 2% is too little if that is what ends up being the offer? Well, Kieran, let's wait and see what the government actually um, brings forward because um, there's been a lot of speculation. Um, and I'm not going to stand here before the start of those negotiations and say what the right percentage is. Neither the um, health service nor the unions would expect me um, to do that. But what I do expect is the government to go into the room and compromise and talk to the nurses. All they're asking is for the government to get in the room. I think many people watching this or just looking on in politics and seeing nurses on strike for the first time would stand or watch in disbelief. All the nurses are saying is, come into the room and talk to us, and we won't be on strike, and the government won't do it. Um, and I think that's the central reason that we're stuck in this situation. Uh, Henry, Times. Hi, uh, Henry Zeppelin from The Times. Um, if you are restraining spending now, no longer getting out the big government checkbook, do you still stand by the policy of abolishing university tuition fees? Well, look, I mean, uh, university tuition fees um, are not working well. They burden young people going forward. Obviously, we've got a number of propositions in relation to those fees that we will put forward as we go into the election. But, you know, I have to be honest about it. The damage that's been done to our economy means that we are going to have to, and we know we will, cost everything as we go into that election. And we will do that with discipline as we've done it so far. So I'm not gonna spell out our manifesto in advance, in advance, Henry. You know I won't do that, you don't expect me to do that. But I can say that every commitment we made will be absolutely fully funded. That's a cast iron guarantee as we go into that election. Um, Jack from The Sun. Jack. Thank you. Um, Keir Starmer, you used your New Year's message to try and champion uh, Brexit voters like never before, even announcing a take-back control bill. Um, many of them will remember you advocating for a second referendum. Do you now regret that, and why should they now believe you? Well, Jack, um, even in those turbulent years, 2016 to 2019, I was always making the argument that there was always um, something very important sitting behind that Leave vote. Um, that phrase, take back control, was really powerful. It was like a Heineken phrase. It got into people. And the more they asked themselves, do I have enough control, the more they answered that question, no. And if you can't make ends meet in your family, you don't have control. If you don't have a secure job, you don't have control. If you feel you can't go out after dark because of antisocial behavior, you don't have control. And I've always accepted that argument. That's why I said in my speech that... Um, you can't deny the basic arguments being made. And I think it's time for us to embrace it when how many years on from that referendum, and that change has never happened. Um, and we intend, as I say, to turn that slogan into a solution um, and to bring forward that bill, a take-back control bill, to deliver it in action. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Lizzie from the Mirror. Hi, Lizzie. dear. Um, Mark Drakeford recently said that he put that Welsh Labour was readying for a snap election because he believes that the government could be on the brink of collapse. Are you doing the same? Uh, Lizzie, I, in the autumn, uh, put our party on an election footing. So I reorganised our teams. I went through everything we needed to do to be election ready because um, back then I thought the government could fall at any time. Um, and we need to be ready um, if it falls at any time. And um, I've also, I've always seen my task as Labour leader. I started in April 2020. Um, the Labour Party was flat down on the floor. My job was to change the Labour Party, to recognise if you lose that badly, 
um, you don't look at the electorate and say, what were you doing? You've changed your party. To demonstrate that the government was unfit to govern, um, and then to lay out the alternative case. And we've been sticking to those tasks, and we are now ready for an election, um, and I put the party on that basis some time um, ago. I mean, as to when the election will be, your guess is as good as mine. I think it should be straight away. I think after, th after 13 years of failure, 13 years of failure on our economy, growing the economy has been um, you know, far, far too slow over the last 13 years. Our public services are on their knees. They've done huge damage last autumn to our economy. Um, and, you know, I think people are entitled to say, we don't want any more of this. Um, we should have a general election as soon as possible. Thank you, Lizzie. Uh, Camilla from The Telegraph. Camilla. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, you're giving a speech in the same venue as the Prime Minister did yesterday. You're both... <laughs> I know you We booked it first, that's all I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great venue. <laughs> um, you're both promising competence, economic stability and optimism. Mm. Um, you're, you both appear to be battling for the centre ground. How can you explain to voters what is the real difference between the two of you? Oh, just look at the last 13 years. How can you seriously come along after 13 years of low growth, 13 years of public services being you know, pushed to their knees, um, 13 years of, you know, quashing the aspirations of many people across the country. Um, you know, nobody really disputes that our country is in a real state, that it's in a real mess. Uh, to come along 13 years along the line and say, well, I mean, the Prime Minister yesterday, it was almost as if he had sort of suddenly arrived from the moon. I was looking around saying... Everything's busted, nothing's working. There was a real commentary thing. There's a bit in his speech where he says, you know, NHS not working, education not working, economy not working. Yeah, and you've been in power for 13 years. Um, so that is the fundamental distinction. No good coming along and making five bland promises um, and saying, well, just give us another chance. I'm sorry about the last 13 years. That's just not going to wash with the British public. Um, thank you, Camilla. Uh, David from the Mail. Thanks very much. Um, your speech didn't mention immigration, uh, particularly the issue of, of small boats, uh, which the PM made a cast iron pledge on yesterday. Um, was it absent from your speech because you don't have a plan? Um, and if you do have a plan, what is it? Well, David, we do have a plan, and we set it out before many, many times. Um, and it's a five-point plan, but the two most important, as far as I'm concerned, are, firstly, I don't want anybody crossing the channel in that way. Nobody should want that, uh, anybody making that dangerous journey. Um, the way to deal with that, in my view, is to tackle the criminal gangs upstream. Criminal gangs are running this. They're running people to the border in North France. Um, and we have to tackle them at source. Now, when I was director of public prosecutions, we ran joint um, you know, cross-nation teams to deal with transport of drugs and guns across borders. We can do it in relation to the trafficking of people. Uh, and the movement of people across borders. We can, we can go after those gangs and get them at source. That's the first thing. The second thing, David, is this. Um, the appalling delay in processing asylum uh, applications is at the heart of this. 4% of those that crossed the channel in small boats in 2021 have had their asylum claims processed. 4%. When I first saw that figure, I couldn't believe it. And that is the state of um, our government and its ability to gr grip this has to be measured against their failure to tackle it at source and their absolute failure with asylum applications. Thank you, David. And then Chloe from the eye. Chloe. Thank you, Keir. Um, on the subject of take, take back control, Lisa Nandy told the eye earlier this week that Labour is looking to align with EU laws in more areas than just security and veterinary standards. When are we going to get the full details of this <clears throat> proposed new relationship? And does this mean that you're prepared to give up UK sovereignty in some areas in order to achieve those closer economic ties? Well, Chloe, um, we've set out, I set out um, in a speech I gave at the Irish Embassy last year, the sort of five principles that we would apply in terms of um, improving our relationship with the EU. I don't think anybody now seriously argues um, that this so-called oven-ready deal is actually working for anyone. Um, and so, of course, we have to address that. And I'll set that out in more detail, but the five principles that that'll be based on have already been set out. Thank you very much.
everybody. Thank you all for coming this morning. I'm really sorry to those of you that had to stand who probably wanted me to give shorter answers just now. Happy New Year. Thank you very much.